Hello, hello, and welcome back to the podcast. It's been like two months since I've made one, but this has been on my mind. I've officially finished Robert Sapolsky's Determined, and I want to talk about it. Of course, this isn't a book review. I don't really do book reviews, but I want to share some of my thoughts after reading the book and how it sort of overlaps to the work that I do in my like philosophy bubble where I talk about the levels, which is my philosophy system. If you're unaware of my philosophy system, again, I'm just a person who's doing something fun for herself, something that I think is interesting. If you want to know about my levels, there's a link in the description and you can watch my video on it. With that said, before we jump in, I am drinking a strawberry tea and it's very good and very delicious. It's the same one I always get from our local tea shop. So, you know, shout out to them. Okay. With that said, I've got some notes that I've taken and I'm really excited to go through this with you. If you haven't read Determined, it's okay. I don't think you really need to, but if you don't know my levels and you don't know Robert Sapolsky's work, then this might be a little confusing. So if you're into philosophy and his work, uh, this definitely is for you. So one of the things that I think is important to say is Robert Sapolsky is Harvard trained. He works at Stanford. He went to, let's see, Rockefeller University. He is a neuroscientist. He is a smart person. Okay. He's a very smart person. And I am not that type of, I'm just a person who likes philosophy, who's read thousands of books and just like, this is the thing that she likes to do with her time. Okay. So I read books to try to figure out myself in the world and my relationship to the world. Right. So Robert Sapolsky's determined is an argument. It's an argument that things are determined, that we don't have free will. Versus if you review my thoughts on philosophy, I would say that I do believe in free will, but it's on a spectrum, right? And so I came up with the system called the levels that sort of talks about that relationship with free will, which I think everybody has in some facet. It's just the relationship of knowing it is different. So with Robert Sapolsky's work, in a, it's a very good book. Like at first I was kind of hoping it would be something different, but then it ended up being exactly what I wanted it to be, which was example after example of philosophy versus the science versus, you know, other people's work versus actual case studies and talking about what it means to be a person. Ultimately, Robert Sapolsky is somebody who's quite controversial. Believe it or not, even though he's Harvard trained, even though he's academia, People discredit him because they get upset that he thinks we don't have free will. He even said and determined that he wonders sometimes why he even makes his work because it makes people so upset, but he thinks it's helping people. And I'm not going to lie. I kind of relate to that a little bit where I don't think you need to go to college to know yourself, but even if you do, the world will still be mad at you if you say something that hurts them or makes them feel attacked. Not like thinking you don't have free will is a very hard concept for the world, especially since a lot of religious bubbles fundamentally say they believe in free will. Even if you act in a free will that is against your God, you end up in hell. So then there's some argument about what is free will if you end up in hell, if you live how you want, right? So when I was reading Determined, and I did listen to the audiobook, so in case that changes it for people, there were a few stories that stood out to me about the relationship with free will and how it interacts with my levels of introspection. So sometimes people will see my level system and think it's a personality categorization system. It's not, it's not the Enneagram, it's not Myers-Briggs, which I still love as tools, but mine is about introspection. How much do you introspect and extrospect? Do you know about the self and the self in relation to the world? So Robert Sapolsky does this from like a very scientific perspective and yet references a lot of philosophers uh, all the same. So here we go. Um, the first example I want to use is, this is from NPR, uh, why brain scientists are still obsessed with the curious case of Phineas Gage. If you don't know who Phineas Gage is, I'm going to read a little part from NPR here. And Robert Sapolsky tells this story in the book. And if you've seen any podcasts with Robert Sapolsky, this is like the famous infamous story people use to indicate that we don't have free will and that we are simply just our brains, right? So if you hop into different bubbles, people think you're a soul. People think you're the consciousness. Science and philosophy are still arguing what the consciousness is. And I am contributing to the conversation with my very limited knowledge, my very limited knowledge. The only thing I can say that I've done in my life to gather this knowledge is live a life that was full and interesting and well-traveled. And I've read a lot of books, but I've never been to college, um, if, unless you count community college. <laughs> and I've never graduated with a degree. So I am not coming from a perspective of academia which I think is really important since many people who do philosophy 
aren't necessarily academic. And I think everyone can engage in levels of philosophy, obviously, and even levels of science because it's about curiosity. People discover things all the time about what it means to be a person. You don't have to go to college to do that, right? So from NPR, it says, it took an explosion and a 13 pound of iron to usher in the modern era of neuroscience. In 1848, a 25-year-old railroad, railroad worker named Phineas Gage was blowing up rocks to clear the way for a new rail line in Cavendish, Vermont. He would drill a hole, place an explosive charge, then pack it in and using a 13-pound metal bar known as a tampering iron. But in this instance, the metal bar created a spark that touched off the charge. That, in turn, drove this tampering iron up and out of the hole through his left cheek, behind his eye socket, and out of the top of his head, says Jack Van Horn, an associate professor of neurology at the Keck School of Medicine, uh, of Medicine at the University of Southern California. Gage didn't die, but the tampering iron destroyed much of his brain's left frontal lobe, and Gage's once even-tempered personality changed dramatically. Quote, he is fitful, irreverent, indulging at times in the grossest profanity, which was not previously, previously his custom, wrote John Martin Hall Harlow, Martin Hollow, the physician who treated Gage after the incident. You'll have to forgive me. I'm not the greatest reader. Out loud. <laughs> the sudden personality transformation is why Gage shows up in so many medical textbooks, says Malcolm Mac Macmillan, an honorary professor at the Melbourne School of Psychology and Sciences and the author of an odd kind of fame, Stories of Phineas Gage. He was the first case where you could say fairly definitely that injury to the brain produced some kind of change in personality. Okay, so this is the argument that a lot of people use to indicate a lack of free will because if the brain is altered, what is free will? Now on my level system, right? And we'll just examine twos through fives right now because ones are just like a very unique case of people. But twos through fives, right? Twos are people who live in bubbles, die in bubbles, and think the bubble is the perception of everyone. So what I think and what I know is the most correct. Twos believe that uh, like if like the world, they're the most normal, like they got lucky. You know, those people who think like I was lucky to be born into the right religion. Twos think like they're the right people who, who were born into the right perspective almost, right? That's kind of one way to look at twos. And three start to wonder, shoot, what if I wasn't born into the right perspective? And fours realize like no one's born into the right perspective. And fives make peace with it because it's very daunting to look at a world that, you know, when you're born into a bubble, into a cultural bubble, they convince you we have the answers. Our religion is correct. Our science is correct. Our history is correct. And then as you start to deconstruct, as you start to dismantle, you start to realize like, oh, who really is telling the truth now? Without becoming a conspiracy theorist, because that is my least favorite bubble, you want to use good data to come to good conclusions. I think Robert Sapolsky's work does use very good data to come to the conclusion that we don't have free will. But I would argue that thing that he says isn't free will can be accessed in what I call evoking free will. Yes, we are biological creatures. I believe in evolution. I think we've evolved over time. I think we're part of the ecosystem that is the planet, the universe, really. And much like, you know, we're just like stardust in the universe. And at the same time, as science studies dogs and their ability to judge us, judge us, indicating a consciousness, plants, indicating a consciousness, humans, indicating a consciousness, you could almost call it a soul. But I would argue that soul is the spiritual word we use for consciousness. And consciousness is the word we use for the brain, brain's ability to understand itself. So if you're a person who's suffered from mental health or a trigger or PTSD or any kind of um, even neurodivergency where you feel sort of paralyzed in your own body, but there's a voice inside your head that's like, hey, get up off the couch. You can do this. That voice that's talking to yourself is talking to your brain. That's what I call the consciousness. Now, not all human beings have an inner monologue, so this might be a dilemma for those people, but I have an inner monologue, right? Some people can think and some people can't. Some people have amphantasia, some people don't. Some people can't form pictures in their minds, right? So first you have to navigate like what kind of a brain do I have? So I do agree with Robert Sapolsky that ultimately if I got Alzheimer's, my ability to introspect and invoke free will would go down because my brain is no longer a functioning computer. And yet, if my brain is a functioning computer, I sort of can have a two-way relationship with my body and my brain. I can have a voice inside my head that says, hey, 
I know we're panicking. I know we're having a panic attack right now, but it's okay. This will be over in a second. That voice that can reassure my brain as it's kind of like rebooting the computer, that's what I call the consciousness. The thing that makes me me and the thing that makes you you is I think more than your brain. I just don't think we have exactly the words or the data to kind of show it, except in these thousands of books and thousands of lived experiences. And if we pull all of that data together, then we have more information. So neither I nor Robert Sapolsky are trying to take away people's agency or consequence for action away from them, because obviously you can live in a world in which you can hold people accountable and recognize whether or not they did it at a free will. I think a person, and he uses this as an example in the book, who has a seizure while driving, their free will is taken away from them. They have no way to engage in it when their body is doing what it's doing during a seizure. So if they crash their car and hurt somebody, it's not that they're without consequence, but we have to take into consideration what brought them to that place in the in the first place. Funny enough, uh, shout out to Kamala Harris, who you guys know I'm a big fan of. Her saying that meme that's going around, you think you're, you know, you just fell out of a coconut tree. You exist within the context of all that came before you. That is actually something Robert Sapolsky talks about. You're not just a you. You're the you that is connected to millions of years of history that got us to this point now. You are biology. You are your ancestors. You are the earth. You are the change in soil. You are the chemicals in the air. Like you are a product of everything around you. There were some people who I think ContraPoints had a really good video about this, about how people in Detroit were getting arrested at higher rates for crimes they committed after being housed in in homes with after um getting lead poisoning right and we don't talk about that we we assume we understand why people do things but we don't really ask ourselves why what contributed the, to them doing this people with lead poisoning have violent outbursts are more prone to getting arrested in that sense because they're engaging in violent acts that make people think oh they're just choosing to be this way but it's not like they chose to be this way if they have lead poisoning. Now, of course, there is a, a line between being in the moment where you don't have your free will and sort of being in the moment where you do. And that comes down to your ability to make like a different decision and to be self-aware, which I would call introspection. I think twos and fives can absolutely do this. I think people can have moments of, you know, you're, you find yourself getting angry in a situation. You go, I'm going to breathe 10 times. <sighs> take a moment and step away from this situation. That's a version of what I would call evoking free will. But Robert Sapolsky might say, you couldn't have done anything else because of everything that came before you. And yet I would still agree with him. Like ultimately I was born with this personality. I am who I am. There are things that could happen to my brain that could change that. I could get Alzheimer's. I could have a stroke. I could get in a car accident. There are so many things that can alter a person, but there is a difference between what I would call a medical altering so like Alzheimer's is a, deteri de a deteri uh, deterioration versus sort of a lived experience that changed your relationship with the world because you had a different perspective. Let's say uh, a person that was like Mormon who realized they wanted to be an atheist. That's like a, that's not a deterioration of the brain. That's a perspective shift, right? That's someone saying, uh, saying I'm going to choose to have a different perspective, right? So Robert Sapolsky um, brings up a conversation with Daniel Dennett, who rest in peace, just passed away recently. And Daniel was very infamous for being very pro free will. And I love that he was referenced in the book. And I love that Robert had these amazing conversations with other philosophers, because at the end of the day, science and philosophy are friends, but they are different. So you can have somebody who's in psychology, like a Jordan Peterson, who is called a philosopher, even though that's not technically his area. You can have Robert Sapolsky, who's a scientist, right? But isn't technically a philosopher. And yet I would say is in some ways practicing philosophy. You can have a, a Dennett, right? Who advocates for this free will and has a relationship with this in a way that makes sense to his brain and his perspective. And that's ultimately all we're doing. We're having relationships with perspective. Okay, so... Most neuroscientists, most religious religious people, even most individuals might say, oh yes, I definitely believe in free will. But then I'll ask them, okay, so why did you hit your kid when you were angry? Why did you cheat on your partner? Why did you cheat on that test? Why did you get road rage? And then they'll say, oh, well, you know, I, I was just really angry and I couldn't control myself. Okay, totally. Let's work on controlling ourselves. 
So that indicates some level of, yes, I believe in free will, but caveat, right? And I think that caveat is where, oh, oh my gosh, sorry. I was like on a roll and then my recording system had like a glitch in the technology. My bad. Okay, we're all having a relationship with perspective, what makes sense to us and how we put things together. So that deviation in thought, do we have free, free will or do we not? What's the consciousness? What's the true self? All of this is why we're still having the conversation because we haven't really figured it out. But I do think the answer lies in all of us. And I wish we could take the, the things that are actually true in all of our belief systems and put them together. Because I think Eastern medicine and Western medicine ha could have a symbiotic relationship. I think philosophers and scientists should have a symbiotic relationship. I think laymen like myself, who's just like a person living her life, can contribute to things like philosophy and science in different ways. We just come from a different perspective. You're not a bad person because you didn't go to college. And you're certainly, certainly not more, like you're not ill-informed because you didn't go through academia. But sometimes these bubbles give us tools to understand things in a clearer way. It's like when you watch Terrence Howard try to argue that one of one or one times one is two. It's like if he understood the basics of math, I think he'd have a better relationship with data. But when you have a poor relationship with data, you end up becoming like a conspiracy theorist, which is why Terrence Howard gets kind of laughed at because instead of using the real data that we have accumulated through years, cultures around the world, you know, have studied math and come up with these empirical understandings of the, of math. He just creates his own thing. And look, that's great in philosophy and that's great in other realms of understanding, but it's not very good when we're talking about the certain area of quote expertise that he would like to delve into. It's one thing to become well-versed in something and to dismantle it and to come up with something of your own. But I think what I would say is Terrence Howard is having a lived experience in which he can't help but go through this journey. And at the same time, when he's ready, he can change perspective, evoke a level of free will and do something else, which I think Robert Sapolsky would end up saying is just what he was always going to do anyways, which is also true. So on the macro, I think we're always just doing what we were always going to do. And then on the micro, same thing connects to the macro. We have an illusion of doing something different than we would have done, but yet we would have done it anyways. And so that's the thing. People can learn and people can get better. We know this because we've seen it. And at the same time, you evoking the right to get better was always what you were gonna do. And that is really hard for people. So you might look at a Trump voter and you might say, uh, why do you think trans people are groomers? And they'll say, oh, because I heard about one or two or five or 10, 10 cases of trans people that have groomed kids. Okay, do you assume all men are groomers? Because I can name a thousand cases. And they would say, no, of course not. Yes, but why not? Why did you come to that conclusion? And yet, if you jumped into their bubble and you were surrounded by people who thought like them, you would feel very like you were right. Like, yes, trans people are groomers, but not men, just the trans, just the LGBTs, not the cis straight hetero people. Mm -mm. Even though in terms of numbers, the greatest threat is going to be the majority of people who are doing set attacks, which would be just like men, right? Now, of course, there's a lot of nuance to this. What is gender in the first place? Who do we even decide who's a man and who's not a man, right? What are we counting as a man? What aren't we counting as a man? There's so much that goes into this. One of the things that stood out to me within the book is his compassion, compassion meaning to suffer with. Robert Sapolsky is an incredibly compassionate person who obviously wants to help people, but also talks about how people get very upset with him for, for just saying, given the research and the science, I don't think we have free will. Now, I can understand this. I would say we do have free will, but I would say that we only evoke it at times. So if you look at the American justice system, 200,000 children are incarcerated a year children, minors, and tried as adults, right? To some capacity, the number could be fluid, but when I Googled, that was the number they gave me. And I'm thinking about that. Just like as a normal person, as an American voter, elections are around the corner. What does it mean to live in a country that takes children who can't consent to many things, like getting a tattoo, but are gonna be held accountable for the environments they're born into, who are, who are sort of pushed into doing actions that are in some ways horrific and in some ways maybe less horrific, 
And then we look at them like you had full agency. This 12-year-old that did this horrible thing, full agency. This 18-year-old that did something, less agency. Now, there is enough nuance to say you could have an 18-year-old who has less agency than a 12-year-old. But generally, you would think we would be more open to the fact that children are put into situations because of their homes they're born into to be pushed into a circumstance that is not good for them. Look, I believe in restorative justice. I believe in rehabilitation. I'm a progressive, okay? I believe people can change and get better. I believe minority communities are often pushed into belief systems and perspectives because of what happened 300, 400, 500, 1,000 years ago. And it's all leading up into this moment, into the present. And I think even white communities that are the majority are also pushed into narratives that have been building for thousands of years, right? I think all of us are the product of everything that happened a thousand years ago and everything that happened just yesterday and everything that happens right now. So how do we have a nuanced conversation about being compassionate to people when they're struggling? I think something that Robert Sapolsky says that I love is that he doesn't like entitled people in same girl. I do not like entitled people. Entitlement assumes you deserve something. I think from a philosophy perspective, we deserve nothing, no one is to blame, and everything is just what it is. It's not about accepting and meaning like approving. It's about accepting so you can help humanity in a better way. One of the sayings on this channel is humans are going to human. And some people hear that and they go, what does that even mean? It's meant to convey like bears are going to bear. If a bear attacks your family while camping, can you blame the bear? Obviously, I think it's kind of silly to blame the bear, and yet you can still be sad that this happened. Not blaming the bear doesn't make it so you can't be sad. It means accepting that nature met another force in nature and this was the outcome. Can you blame the tornado? Or is the tornado simply moving within its nature and nature and nature meet each other and there's destruction? Humans are nature. We are a product of our nature. So everything we do is within that nature, including but not limited to our ability to introspect and extrospect. If I can't get conservatives to understand trans people by default aren't groomers and men by default aren't groomers, then how are we supposed to have any actual conversation, right, without popping said bubble? You have to pop a bubble to recognize like you were not this lucky person born into this perfect idea of the world in the same way you were not a special person born into the right religion. You're just a person born into a bubble and your position in that bubble was painted thousands of years before you even came into an awareness, before you were your parents even thought of you, before your parents were even your parents. So something I love about Robert's book is books is that book is that it's super digestible, determined, is super, super digestible. I feel like if you've graduated high school, you should be able to understand it. There is a couple of chapters that I could see like, okay, I needed to Google some things while I was listening. And so if you have to do that, no problem. That's what Google is for. You can learn while you read. But I did find it to be very digestible. I think just about anybody could listen to it and get at least 80% of it which is really what you need to understand that he is compassionate. He is coming from a perspective of wanting to help people, that it is ultimately about knowing why people do what they do and then having a calm and rational response to it. There is this narrative in America that punishment is king. I think punishment is our lowest common denominator of thought. I think our desire to punish is our lowest level of thinker. Like we are our worst selves when we think about punishing ourselves, when we think about punishing others. I think we are giving in to our most base nature. How dare you be angry at the bear when the bear is simply acting within its nature? How dare you be angry at people for simply acting within their nature? Instead, And instead of like pointing to yourself after you want to torture people, right? You don't hold yourself to the same standard. I saw um, torture techniques, uh, old torture techniques, and it was somebody hang, like you hang them upside down until they die from cardiac arrest, basically. And all the blood flows to their head. And I thought to myself, I wonder if these people think they're good people. Of course they do. Everyone thinks they're a good person, even not good people. People can literally be torturing you and argue that they are good, right? It's not about being good. 
It's about doing what you think is right in the moment. So let's talk about why we think it's right. And that I think is perspective, right? Oh my God, I've been talking. So we do what we think is right because of our perspective. So you're at a grocery store and someone is sitting in front of the, or in middle of the aisle, right? They've got their cart blocking. You've got to move around them, but they're nowhere to be found, okay? So they've just left their cart there. Now this could be frustrating. It's like, gosh, why do you got to do this? Can you just move your cart? Can you just move it to the side? But they're not thinking about you. They're thinking about, oh, I just remembered I got to get butter. And oh, I don't want to move this cart all the way to the butter aisle. So I'm just going to leave it here. So you come along and you move the cart to the side and you're just like, oh, I can't believe this person. They did this on purpose to ruin my day. They didn't do it on purpose. They weren't thinking about you, which is good and bad. One, it's not personal. But two, they weren't thinking about you. Not a very good community member. But then you'll go on the internet and there's going to be big debates about people who don't put their cart back in the cart place. How many people do you see that just put their cart in the parking spot and leave? And you can make any excuse for the behavior, right? In the same way you can make any excuse for any behavior, including a genocide. Not to bring it up, but the way we justify violence is by saying we have God on our side. We have logic on our side. We have freedom on our side. We're allowed to kill these people because we are the right kinds of people. But when they try to kill us, how evil of them. I can't believe they did that. I had a conversation with a YouTuber about closest to evil and closest to joy, right? Evil is a philosophy, religious word. Evil doesn't really, it's such a construct of a word. What is evil to one person isn't evil to somebody else. Someone might think littering is evil and somebody might think it's just not good behavior. Or you might think it's bad behavior, but still do it. Does that make you a bad person, right? We're talking about, you know, bombing Japan, nuking Japan. Obviously, I would say that was an act of evil. But it's justified evil in the context of war. But outside of the context of war, it's just plain evil. Now, even within the context of war, it's still evil, but it's a justified evil you do because human beings are inherently their nature and their nature involves violence. The lowest common denominator or the lowest level of our nature is Uh, our desire to protect ourselves. So we move in fear. I'm afraid these people will be powerful and come for me. So I'm going to destroy them. They're saying they're going to destroy me. So I'm going to destroy them. I get it. It's a form of self-defense in many ways. And yet, if all of us believe like, I don't want to hurt anybody. Like, I don't want to hurt anybody. Do you? Then why do we do it? And this is where, again, we can talk about, do we have free will or not? Do we have free will if we can't figure out how not to hurt people? Or do we learn how to evoke free will by hurting people and realizing, oh, I don't, I don't think I like that. I don't think I like doing that. But then what if you like doing it? Now, I think if everyone was introspective, they would probably be more pacifist than not. But I think you can only introspect with the tools you have. So what if you have Alzheimer's? How good is your introspection then? Probably not a lot. Probably not great. Does that mean you don't have free will? Kind of. Right? Kind of. Does it mean you are less you than you were before? Mm, I don't know. I don't think so. You know, in a lot of marriages, when women fall ill, men leave. And in a lot of marriages where men fall ill, women don't leave. And you could ask, like, could you, did you leave me because of your free will? Or did you leave me because you couldn't do anything else? When Laura Ingram, who's a radio host I used to listen to back in a billion years ago when I was a conservative, right? A long time ago. She fell ill with cancer. She was engaged and her fiance left her during chemo. And I remember thinking, how could you leave someone during chemo who you were engaged to? And the truth is, is that he probably couldn't handle it. And he definitely wasn't the love of her life because I think the love of your life is somebody who stays with you through sickness and in health. And what if he was just another guy that was going to marry her and divorce her in 10 years? Better he left during chemo than 10 years into their marriage, right? So maybe in some ways it's a blessing that he left, no matter how painful it must have felt in the moment. Now, as far as I know, Lori Ingram never remarried and instead she adopted two kids and moved on with her life. She's not my favorite in terms of a thinker, but in terms of a human, I'm glad she survived cancer and I'm glad she adopted a couple of kids. That's really nice. And honestly, I'm kind of glad her guy left her because he was never going to be the love of her life anyways. Sometimes in life, you have to accept that people have to do what they have to do And it is about them. Even when they hurt you, it's never really about you. It feels really personal though. 
because it, it you're feeling the re, like the repercussions of their actions. But yet, is it really about them? You know, when you have a breakup, someone will say, what is it? What did I do? What can I do to make you stay? What is it about me that wasn't good enough? Sometimes it's not about being good enough. Sometimes it's just not being compatible. Sometimes it is about not being good enough. Sometimes it's about a lot of things. But ultimately, until you really ask yourself and start to deconstruct, you'll come to whatever conclusion your brain thinks is best with the most information you have, which is limited. So Robert Sapolsky goes through determined, giving example after example of people that are having struggles, real struggles, and then seeing how humans react to that struggle. When human beings are in pain, other human beings react in one of two ways compassionately, meaning they're like embodying the experience and suffering suffering with, or second, I'm better than you. They pedestal themselves above them and think I'm so much better than you. I'm not going to come down to your level and I'm going to assume nobody needs to love you, lock them up, throw away the key. Now, I agree that in terms of resources, there are plenty of people that I'd rather focus my energy on in terms of helping versus somebody else. And yet, I think ultimately everyone deserves a little bit of help. I know I just used the word deserved (laughs) when I said nobody deserves anything. But in terms of humanity, I think we're all sort of worthy of it. But see, that's, that's a value that I've put on people through my own moral compass, my own moral outlook. I don't believe in objective morality, which means that when I come to conclusions, it's kind of based off this idea that based off the data that I've seen, I don't think there is sort of an objective morality, but I do see that if people act in certain ways, there seems to be less harm. So then I think to myself, well, how do I harm reduce, right? How do I make a better decision? Now, I'm not a fan of identifying with a label label of philosophy and using it sort of like a religion. I'm not a big fan of religion. I'm not a big fan of philosophy as like an identity. Like I am a stoic and I'm only a stoic and I'm only ever doing this. Because again, that bubbles your perspective into thinking this is the only perception when really there's so much more. So I personally like to take from Marcus Aurelius and put it in my little arsenal. And I like to take from Dennett and put it in my arsenal and Robert Sapolsky. And I'm going to take some of this. And oh, even Jordan Peterson, I'm going to take some of this. And oh, Rand, I'm going to take some of this. But the idea that one person could have the, the answer for the universe, I think is a mistake. And I think Robert would agree Maybe that assuming he has the answer for everyone is a mistake. Some people pedestal Robert. Oh, he wrote the book on determinism and he works at Stanford and he's Harvard trained. And oh, Robert Sapolsky, he knows exactly what to do. He is only one voice contributing to 8 billion voices on the planet. And it's a really good voice, but it's no more important than yours. And your voice should be contributing to your own life in a way to move it forward. You don't have to move society forward, but you moving your own life forward will impact society for good or for worse sometimes. So shout out to Robert for writing a book that I think encompasses that very big struggle we all face. How do I know if I'm a good person if I can't even identify a bad one? How do I know they're a bad person if I've done similar things? What does it even mean to be good or bad if I don't believe in a God? What does it even mean to think I was born into the right religion? These are life-shattering questions. If you hit on an answer that makes you think, oh my gosh, do I even know anything in the first place? Sometimes when I see people engage in uh, what they think is correct, like one times one and being two, I feel like they are telling us something about themselves that's much greater than what we're perceiving. That honestly, they're trying their best And it just isn't where they think it is. So getting to the point where you think, I've really discovered something different. When all you're doing is using the data you have to come to a conclusion, you got to then ask yourself, do I have enough of the data to come to a conclusion? Look, my level system, I think, is perfectly explained in Robert's book as level twos. Level twos can evoke free will. It's just that they default to the prescription they've made in their own brain to others. And they figure that's it. That's the end of it right? That's the answer. There's nothing else, which is why they might even get angry at me for talking about philosophy in the way that I do, because they think Brittany can't do philosophy. She doesn't fit into this bubbles construct of what philosophy is in the same way that she doesn't fit into this bubbles gender expectation of her behavior. 
The world doesn't revolve around you and your belief systems, but you're born into bubbles that tell you it does. And that's what's wrong with humanity is they really do think that they are magically born into the bubble that has the best perspective on the world. And they think they can logic them ways into logic themselves into the best perspectives. But if you're going to even doubt the academia, the Harvard trained, the Stanford professor, because he says you don't have free will and that hurts your feelings, then what are we really talking about here? Now, ultimately, I don't think Robert has all the answers, but I think he just gave us a really big puzzle piece in a way that has the paper to signal to people's brains, oh, look, an official academia person is saying the same thing other people have said, but he has the paper. He's not the first one to say it. He's the first one to use this perspective to explain it. It's a really good explanation. It doesn't exempt you from holding people accountable through their own values or asking better of society. It doesn't exempt you from doing well by society. Sometimes people will look at my level system and I'll say humans are going to human. And people think that means like, who cares what people do? It is what it is. No. Sometimes people will look at Robert Sapolsky and they'll say, what do you mean people don't have free will? So what, I can't hold them accountable? Nope. That's not what he's saying either. Neither of us are saying you can't hold people accountable. We're saying hold them accountable within reason. Lots of the ways people try to hold everybody accountable is through cruelty, punishment, and honestly, just illogical means of recourse. Like you're not holding people accountable in a way that is beneficial to anybody, but yourself and your feelings in the moment, because humans are revenge seeking violent creatures when they're engaging with their lowest form of introspection, extrospection. All these people that think they're so logical are literally navigating on one slice of the picture. And that's usually their feelings, which are valid, but not always reasonable. Your feelings are valid, but not always reasonable. So for you to feel like you get to punish these people because what they did to you, where is the logic in that? And then you have the audacity to go to church on Sundays and talk about how you're peace bringers. It's the entitlement to thinking I get to do it because I'm in the right perspective. I get to do what I was born in the right bubble. My advocacy, the way that I like to think about my life is to promote nonviolence. I believe in self-defense, but I rarely think people are violent because of self-defense. I think most people are violent because of revenge. And I think in those moments, you're not evoking free will. You are simply acting on your animal instinct to protect because you're afraid. And so you are moving within your fear, which I think is the root of all evil. Because evil is what is scary to you. You're moving off of this, this uncertainty, this lack of balance with discernment. You're moving further from discernment and wisdom and into your evil, which is out of sync. There is no symbiosis between your introspection and extrospection. And Robert Sapolsky gives case after case after case after case in which people act with malicious intent Mm, or maybe even not malicious because malicious means to in, like to have the intention of being cruel. I would even argue that sometimes they're not even acting with a malicious intent because they don't even know better. They don't even know how not to just move within their nature, much like the bear who's hungry and starving and eats the first hiker he sees on a trail. Who am I to be mad at a bear? And who am I to be mad at a human seeking revenge? I'm simply disappointed that I met this version of nature and nature met me and I either won or I lost or I either survived or I didn't. We are simply nature knocking into one another. You say you have free will, so why are you so violent? You say you have free will, why do you keep cheating? You say you have free will, why won't you introspect? I think you can evoke free will, but I think you have to first realize in the first place that you weren't doing it. And that's really hard for people to recognize because the ego is so rooted in the idea that we are born with the right perception. We are born to the right religions. We know the right way to vote. We know the right way to think. And yet we can't think ourselves out of affairs. Can't think ourselves out of road rage. We can't think ourselves out of PTSD triggers. We can't think ourselves out of destroying. Robert Sapolsky's Determined is really good and I do recommend it and I think you should check it out. All right. I'll talk to you guys next time. Bye.
Also, one last thing before I go, if you guys haven't seen it, Yale professors actually pose this question to one another. Are you your thoughts or your actions? And I have a video about it in regards to bubbles and perception, and I'll link it down below because I think it's another good example of even the people in academia still needing to answer that question. Am I my thoughts, my actions, am I my brain? And this is a very debated topic in all of our communities. And I'm just one more voice who's debating that topic. Who is the real you? Who is the real you when you're not thinking about your friends, family, the pressure of society. Who is the real you? And that's a question that we're still answering, but I think we're getting closer to it. So if you guys want to check that out, I'll link it down below. So why's my life a mess? Please tell me Cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool